Maybe we should call maintenance. I'll fix it. I'm gonna fix it. Concentrate it. Maintain it. Maintain control. Maintenance complete. This is The Maintainers, a blue cap community podcast. My name is David Lee, Director of Attraction and your host for The Maintainers Show. And I'm Jake Hall, the Manufacturing Millennial. And we're super excited to have another amazing episode and guest, Andre Bezzera, who is the maintenance technician at Peterson Precision Engineering. Uh, he has an incredible background and a lot of great stories to share. He's a mechatronics engineer who don't know that it is. It's a combination between electrical and mechanical engineering. And he has some amazing experiences from building a submarine, exoskeletons, a pizza delivery robot, and so much more. But recently, he joined his first U.S. role coming to the U.S. after being born in Brazil to share his experiences and story today. But first, a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and unplanned downtime, allowing clients to save an average of $10 million every trimester. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance. Well, thanks for joining us today, Andre. First of all, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. A little bit nervous to be here on the podcast, but very excited. Well, we're super excited for you to be here. And now, how long have you been in the U.S. for? Well, I've been back and forth since half of my family already lives here for a while now. And I've always been in touch. But actually, for the past three years, four years now, that I've actually been living here to actually settle down, uh, get a visa for my, my job. And I only got it because of my experience as a mechatronics engineer. So I'm very grateful for that. Awesome. So you've been in the U.S. for a couple of years now. Any With winter coming up, are there any winter excursions or places or activities that you want to do now that you kind of have some more time? Yes. Actually, I love snowboarding. I love the snow. And there's a great place here close to San Francisco, which is called Lake Tahoe. And it's a great place to meet, to, to go snowboarding, go camping, sightseeing. It's really amazing to get in touch with nature. So that's what I like to do. Awesome. Yeah, so obviously with your background, specifically being a mechatronics engineer, I remember the moment when I was in college and I saw a textbook in the library of mechatronics engineering. And at that time, didn't even know what it is. So tell us a little bit more about your background and essentially how you got where you are uh, today or more so how you got started in your current role. So um, I'm a curious person by nature. I uh, always liked science and technology and I really am a hands-on kind of person. So I really want to be close to the action, close to the equipment. And I really wanted to do more than just being a mechanical engineer, just working with the mechanical parts. I really love robots and I know that the technology has been improving ever so fast. And I really want to be, to build the whole thing, not just one part of a machine or something or other. And that's when I came across right researching books uh, to the name of mechatronics that really embody the whole mentality of everything a little bit of everything it's a general a course but it's very interesting to know that also mechatronics focus primarily on control control systems development of automation so it's not just about building a machine or robots but about data analysis about mathematics and programming of machines and whole plant systems so do you feel that there's a an increase in demand for mechatronics engineers as like these industries evolve and grow? Exactly. The more automation, the more of IoT sensors that we have, the more about machine learning, that's all in the field of mechatronics. And if you really have just the aspects of electronics, you don't really know what's going on on the side of the hydraulic presses or on the side of grindings, of the side of pneumatics. So if you really have the, a little bit of both understanding how the mechanical part of the machine works and how the electronics can help you 
uh, reproduce that signal so it can be computerized and analyzed as a control signal. That's where mechatronic lies. That's the ed edge of technology as we go forward with automation. So, you know, with that role, there's a lot of different experiences that are there. Can you tell us about like your experiences of building things, right? You know, you talked about a, a submarine, a pizza delivery robot, exoskeletons. I mean, these were all hobbies or projects, you know, that you kind of just did on the side. Like how, how, how did you get those unique experiences and backgrounds? Yes. Uh, as mentioned, I was born in Brazil, close to the beach, and we have a great coral reef next to our city. And we also have in this beach, there's a lot of sea turtles that go lay their eggs over there every year. So I'm always passionate about nature, getting in touch with nature, as I mentioned before. And I really wanted to do something in that mixture. So I came across with the research from Switzerland that they built this super amazing sea turtle, uh, submarine, moving as, as if we were a sea turtle animal. And I want to do that. I think that really is going to capture the whole mechanical part where I have to build the parts for the, for the robot, then I have to install the electronic components, and then that I have to program each of those components to actually work and behave like a sea turtle. So it took me like three years from college to build that. It looked really amazing. It wasn't exactly as, as I dreamed of. We actually couldn't see swimming in the sea, but we did some amazing tests. It gave me a lot of learning and a lot of tools that I use later on on my journey. Awesome. Well, now that we know a little bit about you or more about you, Andre, it's time for our first segment, the Maintainer Mashup, where we do a deep dive into management, teams, and equipment so we can talk about how we make maintenance more reliable. Maintenance required. Listen, I maintain. I maintain myself. Maintain course. Maintain speed. I gotta maintain respect. So can we hear a little bit about uh, Peterson Precision Engineering and your role there, kind of on a day-to-day? -day. So tell us about that. So yeah, right here at Peterson Precision, we have a history of 55 or so years in the business of CNC machinery, fine blanking, grinding, metal fabrications. Uh, so we have a uh, high production of lapping process, EDM machine, deburring, finishing, hydraulic presses and CNCs. So that's a role we work a lot of, we build a lot of parts for aerospace and medical devices, scientific instruments and yeah, it's a great place to work. It's a, it, we're always improving. Uh, we had, we develop our own technology to, to create dyes, to create new machinery and to upgrade the old machines that we once had in the late sixties. Now, some of these machines, they're still here, but they have been rebuilt, remastered to keep up with the demand and the advance of technology as well. You know, and I think you described a lot of manufacturers in general, right? There you have equipment that's 40, 50, 60 years old. And, you know, as we continue to grow in the industry, productivity is, you know, higher demanded. Uptime is higher demanded. The quality of parts is is increasing. The production and quantity of parts is increasing. So I think you, you mentioned that you have like 50 CNC machines that are on the floor, I would assume some purchased in the last few years as well? Yeah, we're actually in the process of already buying more equipment to keep up with the demand. And we have all different kinds of brands from Mazak, Hiramuras, Makinos. We have an amazing team that supports us with pairs with maintenance and from specialized team from all those companies as well. And yeah, I mean, it's all about keeping up with technology and upgrading equipment. Got it. Yeah. So um, basically that modernization of the actual factory and things, you all are actively in that process there. And so that's, uh, that's, that's good to hear. So obviously there's a lot of projects that are going on and have been going on to modernize CNC machines, change out assets and things like that. So mm -hmm. 
that leads us to our next segment, talking about your toolkit. But before we go into this, could you talk briefly, uh, tell us a little bit about some projects that you all have been doing to modernize, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, getting new assets and things, but I'm sure you as a, me a mechatronics engineer, there's a lot more to the story. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So, yes, we have some hydraulic presses that were built in the 60s and have been upgraded with backoff systems, PLC, and then they have been upgraded again and again. We always had some very good engineers that worked before my time here. I just got here this year, so... I haven't really been in a big project so far, but I have been upgrading the electrical cabinets for a lot of our machineries, of our lappings, and doing anything electrical really to help us control and minimize our downtime. So we're gonna move into the next section, what's in your toolkit? We're gonna fix it, get the tool. Pick the one right tool. The right tool for the right job. So, you know, we've heard a little bit more about Peterson, the CNC machines that you have, how you guys operate. But I want to talk more about how you as an individual have excelled, like how you have learned the tools and resources that have helped you grow as a professional. So, you know, how do you view the U.S. maintenance and manufacturing space coming from Brazil? I think a lot of a lot of our audience or listeners probably have only, you know, heard of, of, of U.S. manufacturing and seen U.S. manufacturing, but from you, from a wider viewpoint, with a lot more, you know, experience in different in, in different industries and, and the way we're adopting equipment, what do you see in terms of how they're similar and how they're different? Back in Brazil, there's a big gap in industry size. So in my region, what would be a big company, they would have like five CNCs, and that would be a big company. Over here, we have a medium-sized company going bigger and bigger. We have three uh, sites that we work, but still, we're still considered a medium company size. Uh, that has already 50 CNC's, and it's a big deal. It's a lot of brands, different brands, different kinds of machinery. And the main thing that I think is the difference is that over here, we don't count our expenses to to minimize our spending limit. We just want to keep them upgraded. We want to do whatever we can to get them fixed, to get them running, to minimize downtime. And well, back in Brazil, sometimes you, you wait a lot for things to break or you use a lot of spare parts, parts that you have to really be creative about using what works for you. And over here, we do what, what we can to get the best tool available, not just any regular screwdriver or any regular multimeter. We want the best because we want to be able to keep up with that for demand. We want to be able to be reliable. We want our equipment to last more than a decade, more than 20 years, more than 30 years. And I think that's a big deal here, Peterson Precision. So how would how would you say, you know, from your experience walking into, I would say, a new culture in the manufacturing, right? You know, it's this new ideology where you're planning for long-term success, not just short-term, I guess you could say, results. How would you say the culture of the company has has changed that? You know, you talk about the investments, you talk about, you know, planning ahead. But what were some things that you've learned in terms of how you create a successful culture that cultivates you as the individual to feel motivated to grow, to invest in the company. Yeah, this is one of the great things about working here is the trust when you hire someone, trust that he's going to be able to do the right job that he was hired to do. And also that you can always count on the company to have your back, to, to like, look, this is what we need to work with. This part is going to work, but maybe not so much, not on the long run, but this is actually the part that we need. This is actually the tool that we require and it's what's necessary. And he says, do we have anything better than that? And I'm like, yeah, if you want to spend a few more thousand dollars, then, then do it. Yeah. Then let's go. Let's go with the more expensive one that is going to be more reliable. And when you have that mentality that you're not just fixing things or putting a plug in a hole, 
you're actually taking the chance that something broke to make it better, not yeah. to just replace it or have it running again, but to improve it, continuous improvement. That's our model over here. And that's great that you focus on that, right? You know, creating better processes, you know, but I would say that also can go into, you know, things from your earlier career. You, you know, you kind of, you're continuously looking for, you know, self-learning, continued education. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give then to younger people who might want to explore mechatronics engineering or, or becoming a mechatron mechatronics technician as a career? What advice would you give them, you know, that to, to encourage them to be a part of this industry or tidbits that you have learned to help drive their success forward? Um, curiosity, it's a big deal because you have to, to really want to understand how that works. When you're going to fix a machine, you're not just seeing the symptoms and figuring out the problems. Sometimes to figure out the problems, you have to know how the machine works. It's not essential, but it's important. And in terms of education, you should be able to have your basics cover, have your basics of mechanics, of electronics, of logic programming, and be able to read schematics, whether it's mechanical drawings, whether it's electronic schematics, electrical books, hydraulic schematics. Being able to read those schematics, it's really gonna help you understand how the machine works because you can always ask somebody, but the operators, some of them have a lot of experience, some of them don't. And a lot of the times they just over there to press buttons to follow a protocol list that they receive from the superiors. And you really want to be able to read the manuals, read the schematics and troubleshoot what you need to do. Go right to the point where you need to go. Don't waste any time trying to fix problems that aren't there. You have to be able to, to see beyond what an operator sees because he sees what the supervisor told him to see. But the machine can tell us a lot more information about how she works, how she operates. I think yeah. that's one of the biggest tools that you might want to have, being able to read schematics, being able to understand how the machine works, and of course, being able to do the, the job that you have to do. Yeah, so it sounds like, you, well, number one, you need to be committed to a multidisciplinary approach and really mastering different skill sets as opposed to like mechanical engineers just being obsessed with mechanics, electrical engineers, electrical things as, in, as such. So yeah, that, that actually, uh, that good words for all the future generations and people who would like to get into mechatronics. Uh, so which actually leads me to our next segment. And so the next segment is actually going to be on the futures of factories and essentially what you're seeing when it comes to trends in the industry. Meet the future. To our futures. What future? The factory. My factory. Everybody's factory. I love your factory. My factory. My rules. We know that you have been talking about the projects and modernization there at Peterson. However, mm -hmm. I want to hear uh, a little bit more about that because you did mention at one point in time that you had a five-year plan uh, to basically take you all from where you are now to the future that you envision. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, I think a lot of the uh, audience would find that very interesting. As, you, as I told you uh, before, I've been here for a year now. And after that time, we start to see a lot of opportunities that we encounter. If, if you can go to, you can always go to work and just do what you're told to do. But as an engineer, you're always looking for improvements. You're always looking to do better. And, well, I haven't figured out all the details, but we have a vision about improving our data acquisition, improving how we can monitor our, our assets, uh, how we can improve the timing that it takes for us to do a repair, how to schedule better a repair, and how to record all those informations so we can create better procedures for the future because sometimes you can fix a machine and it's it was super easy or sometimes it was super complicated but eventually you might forget what you did you might forget 
step by steps that what you did. And sometimes, especially on the mechanical side, that is very important. Mechanical engineering is all about precision. It's all about method and patience. When you're taking apart a pallet changer, when you're taking apart a ATC arm, you have to really follow every screw that you took out, every steps that it takes for you to get to the seal that is leaking, to get to the part that it broke off and changes. Even a simple spring can be complicated uh, thing to resolve. And if you don't follow that process, if, if you don't have a record of what you did, uh, a history, then it can be very confusing and you end up having to rely on third parties to come fix your machine eventually when they have the time to do it. When you could yourself be doing something that was already done before. So yeah, in that five-year plan, we have a lot of upgrading to do. We have a lot of development still to be done. We are in, in increasing our production line and I think that data acquisition, processing that information in a time frame, in a timeline that actually works for us, um, finding the right solution for the right problem that fits our company model, uh, our business plan here. Um, and it's all about control systems in mechatronics in general. It, have a CISO control system where you have a single input and single output or multiple inputs and multiple outputs, all that can be translated into maintenance. It can be translated into a recipe, a food system, uh, a building a Lego system set. Yeah. But um, it's all about getting the information that you have, uh, analyzing later, make sure that how long it takes for, for us to do that and make it better, improve it, improve it, record it, uh, track the history and make it better. And then when you all are selecting what projects you're going to actually put effort and money behind, uh, mm -hmm. what's that based off of? Are you just looking at inefficiencies you're seeing? Is there business initiatives that are from the top down or where does that total vision essentially come from that, that you apply to this kind of five-year plan? So from my point, it's coming from the bottom up. So it's coming from my own experience here at the factory plant and what kind of issues that we're dealing the most of here. What kind of problems do we have to fix more and what kind of problems we have to fix less. Eventually, as we evolve, we always get demands from our superiors as well. We need to improve this section this area right here. We have some tumblers, we have some recycling systems that we have in place for water treatment and for solvent. Uh, we have a great machines here that instead of us generating more hazardous waste, we actually recycle all that waste material with a single machine that does all that for us. So proving those kinds of systems in the company comes from the top bottom but actually dealing with the day-to-day -day life here at Peterson comes mostly from the bottom up because they're always open-minded to receive ideas and solutions that might help us improve our workplace, our workplace environment and health issues to um, whatever we can do to make the operators work in a more comfortable way. We're always improving that kind of thing. Andre, so thank you for that description. Obviously, the future looks bright for Peterson. Five years from now, we'll see massive differences, and we can definitely say that that started from, you said bottoms up, but I would say mid-level up with your expertise and things like that. So good on you, you there. I'm sure that they, they'll be uh, very happy with those results. Now, with that being said, before we say goodbye to Andre, let's jump into the final segment, the Fix It Funnies. Fix is in. It's making a really funny noise. I'm gonna fix it. Make it funny would be great if you could make it funny. Your fate is fixed. That makes it funny. Make sure it's funny. So before we ask you about your favorite winter activity, obviously Sierra Nevada Lake Tahoe is a place that has a large 
uh, I would say, fandom of people who uh, would say the same, including myself. Now, but with, with that being said, we have New Year's right around the corner, which is actually my favorite holiday. What are your plans or what would you like to be doing uh, and looking forward to for the New Year? New Year's Eve is actually my girlfriend's anniversary. So we're always getting together and do. sometimes we go to a restaurant that has a nice party or to celebrate New Year's and also her birthday. But... We're, we're maybe going to, to Lake Tahoe this year and enjoying the snow and a nice hot co- cocoa. There you go. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds awesome. So if you weren't in the industry, as a next question, if you weren't in the manufacturing and, and machining and CNC industry, doing what you do as a mechatronics engineer, what other industry would you want to be in? Oh, my God. That's a hard question. <laughs> I put my heart and soul into technology and developing, but maybe learn a little bit more about investments, learn a little bit more about business in general. Um, uh, and also while traveling and sport, sports like camping and kayaking, go mountain bike, stuff like that. I don't see myself being doing anything other than dealing with technology, really. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. Nice. With that being said, then, so there, you, you've done a lot of really cool projects, and even you were a self-starter and uh, did projects before you were being paid to do mm-hmm. so, which shows a lot of passion, right? So is there a, or what would be a dream thing that if you had the opportunity, you had the funding, uh, Unlimited wise, what would you build? What would you bring to Peterson's or just bring to uh, humanity rather? Because I know that you you have something there that you'd be thinking about. <laughs> Every scientist uh, now and then starts asking himself that same question. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to, uh, to pinpoint exactly one thing or the other. But I was, when I was a kid, I was very passionate about quantum computer. So building something like that, working in accelerator particles, that would be really cool to do. And if I could uh, use a mix of the technology and the physics uh, that we study, but actually building something um, in that area, uh, I think it would be really cool, really amazing, maybe reaching cold fusions. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, that, that that sort of answer, it's beyond our own capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. My advisor in college, actually, that was uh, once upon a time, one of his focuses there. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. Andre, thanks for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure to have you. This has been The Maintainers, a Blue Cap community podcast. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts as we are on most major platforms so we can notify you the next time a new episode drops. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and unplanned downtime, allowing clients to save an average of $10 million every trimester. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance.